Welcome to this week's IPS seminar. Uh, I think you all know me, Susan Handy. I'm filling in as host today. And we have a very special guest today, Lisa Almond Hall, who is a professor and chair of the Department of Systems Design Engineering at the University of Waterloo, which is in Ontario, Canada. And that might seem a little random as to why she's here, but in fact, Lisa has very strong ties to Davis. She has spent a couple of sabbaticals here at UC Davis and before going to Waterloo. Um, she was on the faculty at the University of Vermont. So the University of Vermont is a uh, partner in the National Center for Sustainable Transportation that we lead here at UC Davis. And yay, we and just we'll, have our- Yeah, we we'll continue not renewed for another uh, five years, so so there is money around uh, for a while, which is great news for all of us. Um, anyway, so Lisa, as I never have a dull conversation with Lisa, she's always asking provocative questions about everything, including transportation, and um, she's going to do some of that today. City trips. Yeah, so one of the areas she's delved into is longer distance travel, which is one of those little forgotten areas of transportation. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Lisa. Thank you so much for hosting me in Davis again. Um, I feel pretty privileged. Uh, to have had the NCST and Susan and the whole group as, as part of my career for so long, and also uh, to be able to consider Davis one of the places uh, that I call home. Um, so I thought that it would be appropriate today to bring you some of the University of Vermont's NCST research, uh, stuff that I've been involved in for the last few years, stuff I even conducted while I was here. Some of it is well-developed, some of it's preliminary, and I'm wanting you to uh, you know, question me and, and bring ideas uh, to the table because basically inner city travel is this really important thing. And we'll get to some slides here where I say that I think it's 30 to 50% of the passenger miles of travel. Uh, in America, and yet we're not really modeling it very well. And why is that? Well, it's because we don't have data, and why don't we have the data, and what is our role as researchers and our roles as advocates in our, our transportation system field? Um, so anyway, the collaborators uh, whose work I bring today, uh, uh, Liz Duffy was an NCST graduate student, Anwar Onyevek was a, a sub NCST summer student, uh, Dana Roenhold, the UC Davis alum, is the newest University of Vermont assistant professor in transportation. She and I worked with Mitch Robinson on uh, the NHTS California data that Caltrans uh, generously gave us with geocodes. You'll see that theme show up here that we really can't do much unless we know location, right? It's travel and transportation is all about getting from one location to another um, in order to get a service or access to something. But anyway, Caltrans um, gave us this data. It's perhaps the uh, least developed piece of the results I'll show today, but I thought being in California, I should show it. And uh, hopefully I do a decent job of, of these Vermonters research. But I wanted to say a couple of words about the University of Waterloo and my new department. So I moved there in August of 2020. Um, I'm no longer a civil engineering professor. I'm in the systems design engineering department. The University of Waterloo is the largest engineering school in Canada. Like it is a big engineering school. It has a really strong Northern California ties because many of the engineering students there and then graduate engineers come to work in the tech sector um, in California and now in Seattle. And uh, so it's, it's funny when you say Waterloo, most places in America, nobody knows what you're talking about, but when you say it in Northern California, especially the Bay Area, uh, there are a whole bunch of Waterloo a lot there. One of the smaller departments of Waterloo is the Systems Design Engineering Department. It was created in 1970 uh, with the whole idea that systems analysis was the way that you should analyze and look at the world. In 1970, that was, that was you know, not as common idea as it is now. And that designing 
those systems was the way that you change the world. And so it's it's still compelling and I'm, I'm pleased to be the chair, even though sometimes I think, what, I'm the chair of a department with biomedical engineers, how can that be? Um, these are the systems we basically focus on and I'm in, of course, the social environmental systems group because I study transportation systems. Okay, so we're gonna talk about long distance travel and um, it's, you know, what is long distance travel anyway, right? It's one of these things that we kind of know what it is, we kind of know for those of us who are in transportation planning or demand modeling that we're not paying enough attention to it. Um, it's basically out of town trips is what I would encourage you to sort of think about as I'm talking today, even though there's all these definitions and there's confusion about the definitions. Uh, my collaborator, Jeff Lamani, and I have argued that overnight travel is the proper complement to our daily routine travel. Um, the Europeans call it a journey. Um, there's all these things that we'd like to exclude and say, well, we don't include those. If it's migration, it's not long distance travel. If it's the movement of refugees, it's not long distance travel. If it's migrant workers, it's not long distance travel. And I want you to think about out of town travel. Think about everything that it is and sort of try to put our heads together and think about as transportation professionals, as people who are designing the future transportation system, how are we going to think about all of this? So maybe to sort of get the creative juices flowing, we can, we can look at, well, where the heck is Waterloo, Ontario anyway? Uh, so most of us know that this little dot right here is Toronto. Right? And maybe you know that that we got is, is Montreal. Um, Burlington, Vermont is right south of Montreal, where I lived for 14 or 15 years. Ontario, the province, one of 10, is 96% the size of Texas and California combined. So just think about that for a minute. Think about most of you maybe are Californians, so certainly you're studying here. Think about how hard we have to work to explain to people that there's rural areas in California, right? Um, it's, not, it's not just LA, you know, right? It's, it's, it's not just the beach. California is this massive thing. Well, now I'm in a world, back in a world, I, I grew up in a school here, where Ontario is, is even bigger okay, and even more empty. Let's just flip slides for one minute. There's Ontario again. This is the population density, and the black is basically where there's practically no one. And you can see this little bit of an arch of population like that. That's basically the most northerly highway in Ontario. Uh, lots of Indigenous communities, which is an accessibility problem that my colleagues in Transportation in Canada are paying more attention to finally. Uh, but so basically, there's not a lot of people. Here's the Golden Horseshoe, Toronto. Here's Waterloo over here. Okay, about an hour and a half from Toronto's airport. There's a few really intriguing long distance transportation things we can think about when we think about Ontario. First of all, for, the, for how many million people? Let me get this straight. 14.6 million people in this area, 96% the size of California and Texas combined there is one global hub airport. It's between Toronto and Waterloo. And when I say global hub airport, I mean it. There's 50 million employments a year. SFO is 58 million employments a year. So we're talking about a single airport for this massive area um, that has about 15 million people. Now the Toronto-Montreal corridors is also a very interesting interstate corridor. It's about a six hour drive. It's about a five hour train trip. It's been a five hour train trip for a long time. There's double rail um, between Montreal and Toronto. They've had decent, um, you know, I think we talk in California about regular speed, and high speed and higher speed and all these speeds. And of course, in this group, we might talk about the energy of making trains go really fast, right? Maybe there's a speed that's good enough. Um, and they're talking about, they've had a hundred mile an hour trains in that corridor basically since I've been in grade school. So many, 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 many decades. Um, and they're talking about now improving that and electrifying it. If you're thinking about a six hour drive from Toronto to Montreal, you can start thinking about, oh, well, that's another good corridor where maybe we'll put up, what is it you talk about, Gil, the, the gantry lines so we can, the trucks can hang onto the wire and be electrified in the corridor. Um, probably more feasible here. 
than in some of the quarters I've heard you talking about in California. Um, and then, of course, there's the people talking about hyperloops um, in this corridor as well. So it's a, it's a very densely populated corridor. We can think about all the cool long distance transportation things and technology and behavior. But we have the purple dot, which is Waterloo. I've also put a red dot up there. So I want you to think a little bit beyond the excitement of technologies and global hub airports for long distance intercity transportation. That, that red dot is a place called Thunder Bay. Let's we'll flip to the other slide. And we can see Thunder Bay is one of the places that has some population. It's 175,000 people. It's a 16 hour drive from Toronto. It's a two hour flight. There are nine to 10 flights a day. Jets. Okay. So that's pretty cool. Thunder Bay's got access. They've got access to the global transportation system because they've got their nine to 10 flights a day to Toronto's global hub airport. They don't have a train anymore. Or maybe there is a train a couple times a week goes across the But well, what about the other places? Because up in and around, Oregon, to the right of that big lake is Lake Nip Nipigon. Um, it's a place called Hornpain. It's got a hundred, or it's got a thousand people. It's an eight hour drive from Thunder Bay. So if you need significant medical services, you want to purchase certain things, you drive that eight hours to Thunder Bay. Now the Thunder Bay people also drive the eight hours to go see football games in Minneapolis. I was say. <laughs> um, and the Thunder Bay people also drive the eight hours to Winnipeg, which is on the bottom of that lake in Manitoba when they want to go to an Ikea. Okay. But it's all long distance travel, right? And it starts making you think that it's not just necessarily um, about how many passenger kilometers we get for each unit of energy on an airplane or a train or in a car, but what about accessibility? Why are people traveling at all? And I think that there, there is this tendency, even among transportation professionals, such as ourselves, to think, oh, long distance travel, that's when we make a discretionary choice and we fly to Paris for the week. We go to nice restaurants and we scroll along the river and we go to the museum. That's if you're dancing for that's if you're dancing. <laughs> um, but those people in Hornpain, they're going to Thunder Bay, an eight hour drive for a medical appointment. And there's no flying option. There's no mode, there's no mode choice, right? So long distance travel is really, really complicated. And uh, my colleague, uh, Dan Arongo, uh, now at Vermont, um, sort of introduced this uh, idea or sort of combined it uh, with my ideas, what she works, she thinks about benefits or burdens of travel in a local everyday sense, the sorts of things we might think about in the EJ community here about can, do you have access to work? Do you have access to food? Do you, do you have access to medical care? But when we start talking about long distance travel, is it a utility or a disutility? And how does that vary across people? Is it discretionary and non-discretionary? What is it we're trying to get to? And I've even had debates where I argued that visiting friends and family is not, that's not a discretionary trip. Whether you make it to your grandmother's funeral, that's not discretionary, right? That is part of quality of life. That's part of what we would say people should have uh, access to and access to mobility if they need mobility to have the access. And so even shopping, some people's discretionary is other people's non-discretionary, right? Medical, spiritual, leisure, it's all very, very complicated. And so one of my goals, and I'll just tell you right now, flat out, by the time we get to the end of the slides, even if we make it through all of them, um, I want to know how to measure accessibility to long distance travel. And the grad students who've been here a long time know that I've been talking about this for a long time. And I still think it's something that we need to get straight in our heads if we're going to design a really good future sustainable transportation system. It has to be not just biking to work, it has to be a national and global transportation system that makes sense, that actually serves accessibility needs, um, doesn't just drive economies um, or, or whatever some of the other goals are. So I think about long distance travel and I immediately go to inner city and global travel, I include the rural access, and that immediately leads me to saying, well, where should aviation be? in that picture, 
what does sustainable aviation even mean? What does it mean in different contexts? And then what sort of global transportation system serves a future? And that's where I like being in a systems design engineering department because I'm surrounded by these people who do sort of know what I say, do know what I mean when I talk about, we can't just sub-optimize pieces of the transportation system and then expect that we're gonna aggregate them all together and the overall system is gonna be at a global optimum because it's not going to be. Unless we think about all of these things and then deliberately design the entire system, we know that the global system uh, won't quite be right. Uh, random picture of me in a little airplane in Northern Ontario, just to trigger, to remind me, to say to all of you, don't forget about general aviation. We're not gonna talk about it today, but if you look up the stats, there's an awful lot of small airplanes Commercial small airplanes, general aviation is part of the picture that needs to be considered too, even though I'm going to probably stick with the commercial aviation. So this whole idea of inner city transportation um, is not new, right? It's like back to the future in a way, because if you think about before the 1950s, if you go back, you know, hundreds of years to planning the railroads, it was about inner city travel, Right? It wasn't about local travel and getting people to, to maybe ride the bus to work. The, the planning we were doing, the infrastructure we were building was city to city. And that was true until about the 1950s. The railroads, the highways, even the airports. It wasn't about inner city travel. But then in the 1950s, we were faced with pretty big crises in our urban areas. Housing and traffic congestion. And there was this pivot of the federal transportation program, a federal redirect, I call it. And what we've ended up with as a result of these legacy agencies that have boundaries that are too small. The boundaries of themselves and their jurisdictions no longer match where people travel. And the boundaries of the models where we hope to model behavior so that we can change behavior and offer new technology designs aren't actually the boundaries that we should be modeling anyway. So we had some aggregate inner city models, even airport versus highway in the 70s and 80s. And then in the 90s and the 2000s, we had these sort of number of sort of jurisdictions pushing that we had to get back to inner city with nobody really being able uh, to do it. Susan will tell you, I've been giving seminars at Davis saying we need to do inner city for a decade now. And, and lots of other people do too, but we don't know how to get ourselves out of the box. We don't know how to get the data and get the models and really think about it because we don't have the institutions for it. So what are that? So that's a long way of getting to uh, what are the objectives today? And I'm, I apologize, I can't actually see the screen without my glasses. So I have to keep bouncing back and looking at the screen. But I just want you to take this 45 minutes that you have to be here and think critically as planners and demand modelers about how much we're missing when inner city travel is not modeled. What does that mean for our carbon estimates? What does it mean for accessibility? And what does it mean for whether or not we're building the right future system? Um, I know there are people sit over in the building um, and across the street here who think about this idea of robo coaches, you know, automated electric robo coaches. Uh, we do need to electrify the ground transportation, right? And probably some of the flying trips need to be on the surface. Which ones? We don't have a model, how do we know? If we can't estimate carbon associated with different alternatives, how do we know? How do we know what comprehensive system uh, to offer? And so spend a little time thinking about that and send me an email if you have one. Mm -hmm. uh, so exactly how much, how much travel are we talking about? Um, I think I said at the beginning, I, I would suggest to you it was 30 to 50%. So one of the sabbaticals when I was here in Davis, I decided I would get out all of the Bureau of Transportation Statistics data and I would try to look at it over time and how much of it was local and how much of it was out of town and make an estimate. Uh, because the Europeans were making estimates and they were estimating about 45% in some cases, up to 45% of passenger kilometers of travel in that case were intercity or long distance. And if you long love these various BTS sources, you can suggest that maybe 30% for miles of travel by rail, bus, car um, in the United States is, is inner city travel. But we have to be careful comparing European yes. rights to American because it's all, you know it's so much densely more densely packed. Sure. So yeah. I, I agree with you, David. <laughs> okay. But 
Then I did it a different way, a different way that David would not approve of the statistics. Just really. no. um, um, I'm a very disapproving guy most of the time. So. I know, I know. <laughs> it's always scary that he shows up. Um, so the other way I did it is I, I had these people I tracked in 2013 for a year, and 628 of them over 50% finished the survey for a whole year. And I knew who they were and I knew how many trips they took. And so I went into the National Household Transportation Survey and I pulled out similar people, uh, similar demographics and similar locations. And I tried to construct the trips and distance that were in their sort of daily and overnight round. So on the x-axis here, time. How long is your trip? Do you do it within a day? Is it a day trip or is it an overnight trip? And then on the y-axis, was it less than 50 miles or was it more than 50 miles from your home? Why 50 miles, you might say? Because we are obsessed with 50 miles as the ridiculous definition for what long distance travel is. You gotta break that habit somehow. But anyway, it doesn't really mesh with anything, but it has been a definition in the US for, for a long time. And so I looked at how many of their trips were overnight long distance. 1% of their trips were, but 47% of the distance they traveled were. Now these 628 people, not your average people. They were what I call the global mobile elite. They were, they were highly educated, um, uh, high socioeconomic uh, standards. They, they traveled a lot, okay? So, so it doesn't really matter. Like even if my statistics are horribly wrong, Right, and only 20% of passenger miles of travel are long distance. We are missing an appreciable part of the travel and the accessibility, the things we need. And, you know, for many of us, uh, the carbon emissions associated with transportation, the ability to, to come up with a more sustainable transportation system. So we've got that weirdo 50 mile thing. The second thing that we need to consciously recognize is a little bit weird is that we do really separate air and ground transportation mm -hmm. in our transportation profession, right? The airport is this special origin or destination in our ground transportation model. You get there, we worry about how you get there, we worry about how much you pay to park there, but once you fly away, we forget about you, and we forget about your carbon, you're gone. You're out of our system, we're no longer modeling you, right? So we've got this weird thing. And sometimes, and, and one of the things we talked about at the lunch beforehand was uh, 10 years ago when I started talking about this, people would literally say to me, Lisa, the aircraft are 8% of 27% of the U.S.'s carbon. Just forget about it, Lisa. Don't, we've got bigger fish to fry. We don't need to worry about it. And one of the things that's happened over that last 10 years is people are worried, are worried about the airplanes. And I think that's a good thing. But the bad news is that we don't really have a way to estimate the carbon, and we don't really have a way in our paradigm of, of modeling something like mode choice of integrating the ground and air options. And so that's exactly what the sort of NCST work that went on in Vermont for the last few years, um, and that we will continue doing. Well, I guess they'll do. They maybe do different things, but um, um, that's what we were trying to get at: is how. How can we model both air and ground transportation at the same time? Another thing people would often say is, oh, Lisa, don't worry. This is the energy per passenger mile of the different modes, cars, transit buses, aircraft, rail. People would say, the aircraft, they've improved so much. They've done so well. You know, this is 1980 to 2012 the energy efficiency per passenger kilometer improvements have been amazing in air. But I would suggest that we're kind of gonna, we're gonna top that out. By 2050, they only expect about a 2% improvement um, per year because there's only so many ways you can design an aircraft. There's only so many ways you can improve your ground operations. There's only so many ways you can ensure that you get the passenger load as high as possible. So you get this energy per passenger mile down. But pause there for a minute and say, think, think again about that person in the middle of nowhere, Ontario, needing to go to a doctor's appointment in Thunder Bay. They don't really care about efficiency per mile, right? 
if anything, they're, they're thinking about the trip, the trip they have to make. And so I would argue that this has been a little bit of a, a misguided way to be thinking too. It's about the vehicle efficiency. It's a great way to think about if you're a vehicle designer, but many of us are not vehicle designers. We're thinking about serving that accessibility of the transportation system. We're not actually trying to get as many kilometers as possible. We're trying to, to meet the needs, right? We're trying to make a trip and the shorter that trip is, uh, the better it would be. And then the last reason I think that air is absolutely worth those of us who think about ground transportation trying to incorporate is because it is really growing. And, um, you know, this is, this is a pre-COVID um, graphic, uh, but it, it shows the general pattern, which is, you know, in, in other parts of the world, the, the air demand growth is really, really significant. So we have to worry about it. As I say, I think that we're getting to the point we had, you know, a lot of attention on flight shaming and we have um, great uh, media doing fantastic um, infographics and sort of illustrating the idea that you should worry about the efficiency of the trip, not the efficiency of the vehicle for mile travel, but the trip. And I would have shown you these graphics, but I know we're recording and I was afraid to do it because of copyright. Uh, but if you want to see sort of the cool way that the media is trying to get the public in general to think about the efficiency of a trip, the trip from New York to Toronto in this case, um, this, this is a, a great example. But that leaves us back with um, the researchers in the NCST family thinking about how do we bring some of this thinking um, to our actual, to, to the models that we're using. And so this was uh, Elizabeth Duffy's um, thesis, her whole overarching question, which is not really a realistic question, was can modal substitution reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the long distance inner city system we have right now? in the continental US. So if we just had everybody switch to a different system solution and they took a different mode, would we save carbon emissions? Everybody would still get to their destination. Right? And so that's a silly question because there's feedback loops in this complex system it would never happen, right? If we diverted some people from airlines to the ground, the airlines would sell those seats to somebody else and we might have overall increased emissions. So it's, it is an academic question. But it led her to doing this research on carbon calculators, which I thought would be of interest to you, um, which is uh, what's, what's a better way, a better way than just the aggregate average fuel per kilometer to estimate greenhouse gas emissions. Um, do, do the greenhouse gas emissions vary flying or driving? So that's a question that comes up at the dinner party table or I don't know, wherever these questions get asked, like, you know, the trip is this long, should I fly or should I drive, you know? And everybody sort of says, oh, about 500 miles, but nobody really knows why. So that's essentially question number two. And um, then she wanted to know of the travelers in this long distance survey we had, how many, what proportion of them were already taking the carbon efficient mode for their overnight long distance trips? So again, I think they are academic questions, but important questions that inform how we how we develop models moving forward, right? So she did what any good grad student does, and she looked at all the possible carbon calculators uh, that people use for airlines. And so, of course, the easiest calculator you can think of is we know how much fuel is purchased, you know, for commercial airlines, and we know how far they fly, and we know how many people fly, and so you can get you know, an emission factor, an average emission factor, and you can estimate the carbon associated with the trip. And when we do that, we typically apply it from an origin airport uh, to a destination airport. But this is, this is Lizzie's calculator down here. I think she called it the Vermont Inner City Carbon Calculator, uh, which is kind of, uh, kind of great for those of you that know Vermont. It's, it's not, uh, not a big place where there's a lot of inner city going on, right? Uh, but she uh, wanted to have the distance in it, uh, how the fuel was burned during landing and takeoff is the LTO, uh, consider the taxiing at the various airports. She had the radiative forcing factor in there for the fact that the emissions, some of the emissions were above 3000 feet, wanted to take into account passenger load. Uh, she 
could have with the data. I'm sure you did aircraft, but it was one thesis, so she didn't. Um, the airport and the ground operations, and then finally the access and egress to the airport. So if you think of did you, did you um, say this was like a 500 mile trip uh, or not? It is so we had we had 1,200 trips, I think, from I forget how many people, but it's coming up in a slide over the course of a year. The majority of them lived in Vermont, Alabama, or California. Okay. All different lengths, and we only used the ones that were longer than 250 miles. Out and back, one way from home, we excluded the grand circle trips and any of the trips that were more complex spatial patterns. Okay. So, so we, we, we did have a, a bound on that so we could compare taking the train or driving or whatever. Yeah. And okay. she only compared it to a very crude uh, drive. Okay. Anybody else want to interrupt me? Please I'm do. I'm sorry. That. No, 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 no. I, everyone is welcome to interrupt because I can talk fast and have no emotional need to get through all the slides or anything like that. So what was Lizzie doing in the Vermont inner city carbon calculator? She was trying to add uh, the emissions from uh, the different stages of flight operations. She was wanting to add access and egress travel because this is per trip, right? We're not designing the airplane. We don't not worried about the emissions per passenger kilometer or per kilometer, right? We're, we're, we're travel demand people. We're worried about getting the person access from their origin to their destination. So of course we need to know all stages of that trip. Um, the emissions from the airport and the ground side, you know, completely flying under the radar, right? No pun intended. We don't, we don't add in the operation of those massive city-like airports we maintain in a society. And then, of course, the radiative forcing, um, which is a controversial thing with big uncertainty around it in and of itself. I think she used a 1.9 factor. But... So let's go back to this survey. So a lot of people sort of said, well, why don't you, you know, why don't you calculate it for, you know, hypothetical trips from city A to city B and all that. Um, and we didn't do that. What we did is we said, well, what we have in our profession is travel surveys, and we know what the person did, right? So we don't typically say, what are all the modes you considered to go from home to work? And then record, well, maybe Amy does sometimes in the campus travel survey or something, but in most travel surveys, right? We just, we say, what did you do? And then we sort of estimate the other options. We consider them in our mode choice type models. And so that's what we wanted to do in this case. We wanted to consider all of the trips they made. This happens to be the Vermont residents. The blue are the trips they took by airplane. The red are the trips that they uh, took by car. There were a handful of rail or buses that, that we excluded. Um, so a year of trips from 25% uh, of the sample. So it might have been, sorry, David, I don't know that. It might have been like 250 people, maybe more than that. Um, we did only the out and back trips and we limited them to the continental US. So there's not really a mode choice to Europe or Asia, right? And then these are the distances from zero to 2,500 kilometers one way. And we see, especially in this middle range, both airplane and passenger vehicle being used. And what she wanted to know was, if I add these factors to a carbon calculator, which, which trip at which distance is actually the, the lower carbon? So it's really hard to do this, right? Because now all of a sudden we have to say, well, we did know the geocodes of the origin, and we knew the geocode of the destination. They interactively picked them on a map. So we didn't just know you were going to the Bay Area or anything like that. People, people told us where they were going. So then you have to figure out what were the air options? Were there realistic air options? How many air options were there? So just imagine being in the Bay Area. You have a choice of airports. Even in Sacramento, you have a choice of airports. If you're going to Montana, how many combinations? You know, what was the air option? If somebody reported driving to us. And the amazing thing about this, and I, I fielded an email about this from Davis just in the last 10 days, 
We have this data in the US. The FAA has really good data that can help us figure this out. There's three databases that you'll see on the future slides from the FAA that can help us sort of look at what, what is the air accessibility, if you will, from point A to point B. Um, so what we did is we looked at the three closest airports to the origin and the three closest airports to the destination. We ended up only using 140 of the thousands of airports that the FAA keeps data on. We used mostly hubs and hubs that were far away from other places. So an example of an airport that we threw out was White Plains, New York. It's a small airport, but it was, it was sort of mucking up like everybody was going to White Plains instead of JFK. And, uh, I think we had the California Household Travel Survey actually from 2013 helping us calibrate this was Anwar's work, uh, which, which airports were truly being considered between origins and destinations, because in that California survey, they had the airport usage. But anyway, so we have these 140 airports, three closest to the origin, three closest to the destination. Now you've got nine airport pairs, and you've got to calculate the weighted travel time pairs between those airports. Let's see, you might be getting dizzy already. I was often dizzy when Lizzie brought this stuff to my office. If you go into the FAA's DB1B data, which is a, a random ticket sample, it's year long, they produce it every year. Uh, what you see is the sort of blue, red, and black. You see the routes between airport pairs. And between many airport pairs, like there could be 10, 15 loop combinations, all right? So there's segments, let's get the data on a segment out of the T100 data, that's that airport between a pair of airports. But when you buy a ticket, you actually buy the whole route. So maybe you go through two airports, maybe you go through one, maybe you have a direct flight, well, you, you, know, you can see that this is already a simplified slide because if you're going from New York to LA, maybe you go through Atlanta, maybe you go through Chicago, right? There's all kinds of combinations. But in the DB1B data, we know how many people did each of those combinations. And so you can actually calculate a weighted travel time, in effect, you know, the approximate travel time between any two airport pairs pretty accurately. Um, across all of the combinations that we had. And that's, that's exactly what Anwar did. That's what, that's what this um, algorithm is. He went into that data set and basically calculated the, uh, the weighted travel time. And we and Lizzie used the minimum, the airport pairs that had the minimum travel time. Uh, that, that's, the air, that's the sort of routing. Those are the pair of airports she picked. I see many frowns, so I'm going to go back. <laughs> like tons and tons of airport combinations, tons and tons of road combinations. We know in our survey where the person was coming from, where they were going to, but we needed to know which airports they used. And so we picked the airport that corresponded to the weight, the minimum. We didn't, we're just picking the origin and destination airport. We're not, for, we're not picking which route they're using. But just saying, what, what airports are we going to identify for these people here? And there may be many, many ways to get from origin airport to destination airport, but we need to know which airports they went to. We evaluated three on each end. We picked that OD pair. It had a, a weighted travel time associated with it. It was based on the travel times as scheduled by the airlines. But you said you didn't actually use their airport. You used the closest airport to their destination. There are three. We evaluated the three closest so three, to the origin. Yeah. The I'm just thinking about all the times I've gone into White Plains, okay? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so. It's not without sources of air. Is it total travel time from moment left there or from first takeoff, or does that account for layover time? So we accounted for waiting times exit times and layover times based on the size of the house yeah is there any way to account for cost well uh, so when I, we did our mode choice papers with jeff Lamondia, some of you might know and he and i did more choice papers we also had the cost 
um, and we used it. I think I'm remembering it was statistically significant. So the price paid for that ticket is also in the DB funding. Yeah, but in this, you're trying to, in a sense, eliminate costs from the consideration. You're just trying to figure out a good way to compare the emissions. So you don't want the economics to mess it up. Well, many people would argue the economics might save us, David, but um, that we should try to use the economics to save us. But yes, well, that's a separate Liz, question. A separate question. In Lizzie's case, she's interested in the carbon estimate for an air trip versus a ground trip. In the mode choice papers with Jack, we were interested in more about the characteristics of the bundle of mode options available to people so that we could try to forecast mode choice. Two different, two different things. Okay, so then we get to the part that would just offend all the people who do modal emissions modeling for vehicles <laughs> that I know, which is many people at Davis, uh, but we need an estimate of the ground emissions uh, we use average parameters out of EPA's moves and a Google API to figure out the distance between the origin and destination. We use that average emission rate to get uh, the ground-based emissions. We don't even we don't even use type of vehicle, right? It would matter. Is it a Prius? Is it an SUV? But uh, so just the national average fleet uh, for the given year, um, and then we estimate the air mode emissions, which is the access driving. So from the origin of the origin airport, the egress driving, again, maybe they didn't drive, maybe, maybe they took an electric shuttle away from the airport, but we estimated both of those as driving. Uh, we had the um, operation of the airport and the ground side equipment um, at the airports, the flying stages, the taxi, the landing, the takeoff and the cruise, depending on how many stages there were, and then you get the air emissions. And we pulled all of that data, I don't, do not look at the detail. We pulled all of it out of these FAA databases, um, the airports, the on-time data, the T100 data, and then under, underneath the little pushage stamp on the upper right, uh, that's the DB1B, the most important letters to write down if you are interested in pursuing some, some air uh, research. It's a really good database and a lot of countries have it. And so then this was the data we got out. And so what's interesting about this is it's not average air emissions, right? It's not, it's, it's actually trip-based. So all these people, they had origins, they had destinations, they had a straight line distance from their origin to their destination, and then they had the highway mode emissions estimate, right? And the air mode emissions estimate. For each and every trip, regardless of which mode they took, we calculated the carbon associated with ground and air for every trip. Okay, and if you're still with me after all that, I think that this is the best graphic out of Lizzie's thesis. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a moment to think about what it is because it's the air emissions as a function of the distance from origin to destination, not the origin airport, the destination airport, the actual trip, the ultimate origin and destination. Okay. And the dark blue is from the airplane. The light blue is the airports and the ground side equipment. And the orange is their access and egress driving. Now, the first thing you think about is, wow, those bars are jumping all over the place. This is a really bad model. Why are those jars, bars jumping all over the place? And we'll look at a little bit of why they're jumping all over the place. But about 40% of the emissions are from the airports and the driving that we don't normally account for when we estimate flying emissions. They just kind of, well, we just sort of forget about them, right? So there's a lot of emissions in an air trip that we're not accounting for in most of our carbon calculators because we're only focusing on the airplane. And then the jumping around in particular is, is because we don't have the full range of distances. We don't actually have a uniform plane of origin destinations and airport availability. So we wouldn't necessarily expect pure smooth curves like we were modeling something in nature anyway. And that's not me making excuses because I'm gonna show you slides next where I'm certainly gonna show you that there's an incredible amount of error and variation in, in the estimates. There's like a few frowns. Doesn't direction matter? 
Yes. Okay. Not accounted for. Right. Flying uphill. Thank you for flying uphill. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So I'm worried that you can't see this in, in this room. Um, but this is, again, the true distance from the origin to destination as the crow flies, as we like to say. And this is sort of the, the air emissions, which arguably we could almost say the length of that trip doesn't matter to the air emissions, right? But what, what she did here was she looked at the worst case scenario for the route you picked between your two airports and the best case scenario, right? So obviously LA to New York, best case scenario is take a direct flight. Right, on a full plane. And actually the, the passenger load is a factor she did have in there. She's able to get that. Um, and then the worst case scenario would be like stop twice, right? One from New York to Atlanta, Atlanta to Salt Lake City, Salt Lake City to LA, right? So that would be the worst case scenario. So this, this is the error associated with the routing, the different types of routing we have in our air system. And then these, this little gray bar is her choice of parameters in her models. The average emissions of, of an airport, the, uh, the uh, radiative forcing factor, right? So, so what she's doing with here is sort of saying, well, where is all this variability in the system? Like we're trying to model an absolute mess. Like one of the things you can sort of say within these slides is, oh my gosh, no wonder we don't model this. Why would we try to model this? And she's sort of saying, well, where is the variability coming from? Is it about, is it about the accuracy of our models or is it about true unbelievable variation in what's going on in the air system? And the answer is that there's a lot of real variation. It's not model error. It's, it's the amount of variability in the emissions that may be attributable to you going from A to B. What you're saying is the same trip can cause 250 to almost 2,000. Yep. Yep. My hypothesis is uh, we will do a simple gravity model. It will catch most of the variation because if you have high gravity at the original destination, you have higher uh, efficiency in direct flight. The need for layovers are in order to fill up the planes. If you don't have enough people want to come from here to another place, you need to do layover to reshuffle the people. So that would be one thing. The other, if you have high gravity or higher density, you have long, get low, shorter trips to the airport. You have more airports, Bay Area, LA. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot about the size of the original destination. Really but don't forget, in most of the modeling, she's accounting for the relative number of people that did each of the crazy things. But the, the ability to have a full plane direct flight, yes. it's about the size of the original destination, the demand on both ends. Potentially, yeah. And, and how, how many airports they will put around so they don't need to drive fast and far. Mm -hmm. so. I'm going to skip watching the clock. I'm going to skip a few slides. Um, and I, I've stared at this for so long. The red is passenger vehicles. Here's the trip distance with one person. The orange is two people. The yellow is three people. The blue is air with one or more transfers. The black is air with less than one transfer. All the variation Gil and other people are thinking about is in here. Why is there bouncing around with an average emission rate in a vehicle? It's because you can't drive the straight line distance, right? There's different amounts of diversion that's in there and the route's chosen. And so I think the thing, there's only two, two real take home messages I can take from this. Number one is, as we all know, filling vehicles really matters, right? So that needs to be part of what we design into the future system. We want vehicles running full. Um, uh, but then the other thing is, is that there's so much going on in the air transportation system that anybody that's giving you a carbon estimate, um, you, don't, you don't really know if it's true. Um, through this slide in, because I think it was Amy that helped us do this, uh, which was the prediction interval stuff. 
probably don't even remember doing it, but um, you could sort of say to yourself, well, what about the ratio of air to highway trip emissions? Because we all want to know, right? The answer to the dinner party question, if the trip is X miles long, should you fly or should you drive? Um, and the answer is really, there's these massive ranges uh, where we can't say for sure. And it really also depends on how many people uh, are in the car. But it, it is kind of, it's surprisingly, it is sort of give or take around 400 miles, which is what we say based on the average emissions. Uh, so we could just argue for, for aggregate modeling. Um, so the most efficient way of travel mode uh, cannot be assumed. Air routing accounts for a lot of the uncertainty in the estimates. Uh, Non-flying emissions are sizable in that overall air trip. And about 80% of the travelers in that survey were actually choosing the mode that was most efficient. And um, I'm going to remind you about uh, the accessibility thing and then stop uh, so that we can have discussion. Uh, but I, I want to sort of bring back to mind this idea of equity and travel burden in our intercity transportation system. And so this is very much Dana's um, thinking if we think about the number of long distance trips a person takes in a year, and we think about the amount of access they have to need services, things in their own home region, their local home region, okay? If we have somebody with very little access near their home and very few trips, we might say that they, they have burden mobility. If they have um, lots of access, got this right, I hope. No, it's okay, I have a second version. <laughs> <laughs> I was checking to see yeah. if you all were yeah. away. Uh, this is actually the version we put in the paper and I thought it was making it easier. But if you have many long distance trips, here we go, um, but not a lot of access locally, you have potential burden mobility. If you have, low or no long distance trips with low travel, unmet needs, right? If you have high regional access and a lot of trips, you have potential su sufficient access. If you have many long distance trips and high access, so you live in downtown San Francisco, but you do lots of trips, well, that's unburdened mobility. And so this is a, a model we're trying to work on and the problem we're having is we don't know how to measure accessibility. You know the way in local areas we sort of measure how many jobs are within a 30 minute transit ride or how do we get at that when air travel means that essentially the whole globe is kind of accessible to you and we've been leaning towards um, the donut measuring model. This is with our Caltrans data regional, super regional, extra regional data. And I want to stop talking so you guys can talk um, and just prove to you we haven't tried to do it for California, but it's really... Oh, God, we'll just look at that. Got it. Okay, Susan <laughs> wants to look at it. Um, you can see it kind of makes sense who's got low regional access and low super regional access. Those are the people in the rural areas. But really in the scale of access, everybody's kind of got access. So how are we going to tease this out? And you know, it all comes down to, you know, who gets to fly wherever they want and who maybe can't even drive the eight hours to another bay to a doctor's appointment. So there, there's this realm of accessibility that's even beyond what we're looking at our local needs. Okay, now I will stop talking so that you guys can ask questions. I think we're going to go back to this. Yeah, uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, sorry, maybe this is a simple question, but how come we don't see a relationship between, like, like even a slightly positive relationship? Just because, like, longer trips should use um, more fuel. And they should, yeah. Yeah, so the reason for that at this scale is because the miles topped out at 2,500 and it was in the continental U.S., and so when you start seeing um, that increase for long haul flying, it's, it tends to be the, the intercontinental flights, which weren't excluded. 
and you're taking off with more fuel to go much further. So part, part of the leveling is because of the truncation of the continental distance. Does that make sense to you or no? Well, uh, okay, so at one point you mentioned like the best case scenario is like a straight flight and been fully, the plane's fully loaded. So if you had like a trip that's 250 miles, 2,500 miles, shouldn't that best case like 2,500 still be higher? So you also have the um, correlation of airplane type with the route length and the origin and destination airport type. And so you, you get into more, more passengers, more passengers okay. and, and the low factor that Gil's talking about. And she, and she is getting some of that um, variability, but then others, other stuff is going on that. Um, Got a couple more questions, but uh, how how would you look at the the GHG modeling, especially for the um, the driving trips? When you're looking at uh, anything between an, a clunker SUV and a uh, very efficient sedan that's mostly used just for like they can't fit say four people. Yeah, so we did know that car these people owned. So we could have done the vehicle type. We even knew the age of the cars. Um, but there was another problem in estimating driving emissions and that we didn't know the time of day or the day of week they did the driving. And lots of them were in congested places like California and driving into greater New York. And so we did some sensitivity analysis around what time of day are you telling the Google API in order to get the route and get routing around congestion? I think we went with Wednesday noon or, or something, but there was so much variability in the traffic operations um, that we decided not to pay attention to the vehicles. And I, I, I do not know my, other than fuel efficiency, um, well enough to sort of comment on your actual question. I do know that we did we did some looking at average vehicle fleet average versus a Prius. And that that's noticeable, which is a Prius has about twice the fuel efficiency of, a, of the average fleet vehicle. So can we add about 200 miles if you drive electric? <laughs> so yeah. Instead of 400, about 600. Of course, the people in Alabama versus people in Vermont and the source of the electricity. I mean, it just goes on and on. Drive to LA. <laughs> drive to LA, don't fly to LA if you have a Tesla. If you have, yeah, exactly. Next question. Um, yeah, uh, sort of jumping off of that, uh, did you also collect uh, how many uh, people were in the, the journey? Um, how many, was it like just assuming it was a single passenger traveling or was it families of four? So we ran the model for one, two, and three people mm -hmm. in the car. Um, but we did not correct for the number of people on the trip, even though we had it, because we didn't actually know that they exactly traveled together and we didn't know what to do with them once they were in the airplane. And this was only a master's thesis. I want to point out. Like, this was pretty amazing that, that Lizzie uh, did this. Um, yeah. But there's so many other variables that, yeah, if you want to come study at Waterloo, you can add the variables to the model. <laughs> Lisa's looking for a postdoc. <laughs> and grad students, too. Sorry. Yeah, no, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good. Thank you. Thank you. This is great. Um, you made like a super solid case for carbon tax. <laughs> for what? Carbon, carbon tax. tax. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Which we have in Canada. Like. I know, I know, that. I know. I came and said like, no, they're not. Like, yes, actually yes. the highest is, is you guys planning to 38. Yeah. The recommended is 40, should be 200, but it's okay. You know, it's, the U.S. is not doing it. Yeah. And I get my little check in the mail, which is the redistribution of those carbon taxes. I'm sort of like, oh my gosh, wow. let's do something else with that. Yeah, it's <laughs> from oil sands, Calgary. Mm -hmm. There's great. That. There's that. Um, <laughs> it's there, like, quit a program. <laughs> You're not sustainable. Um, yeah, so you said 80% choose the most efficient route because they can pay it. That means I, I'm just, I just choose. I don't want to do layovers, right? I, it's No, I, I would say that... that Non-stop that people who say, I don't want to do layovers are, are not, I mean, there's the layover graph that I, I sort of skipped. Um, yes, in general, on average, you can say that a direct flight is associated with fewer emissions. 
but overall in the prediction interval case, you, you can't say that with a high level of certainty because there's so many other factors at play. And I used to always say it was the miles that, that, oh, airplanes are great per mile, but look at how many more miles you go. But I think within the continental US, that's not actually true. There's just so many other things. How full is the plane? How old is the plane? Um, how, how congested was the airport? What was the average taxi time at that airport? Um, all of that is, is bouncing around the estimate so that you can't say for certain um, what's the best type of one. The, the, the bio, bio, variability is very large, like a factor of 10 in emissions, yeah. right? 200 to 2,000. Yes up to 10 yeah. times, yeah. Uh, that'd be like a great. What are the main variables pushing the emissions other than the, the miles? Because those we could make those flights more expensive and then people will not take them. <laughs> I, but then the airlines will charge more for the first class seats in that plane and less for the coach seats to fill the plane and it should, so and I'm, don't get me wrong, okay. I'm not any airlines. I think that we just can't rely on the airlines to plan a sustainable global aviation system. They are businesses, they sell the service and they do it really well and we need them for our global society. But I, I think that the problem when we started policy. playing those games was the feedback loops mm -hmm. that kept filling the planes. Back in Mexico, they put a, a, you can't drive. So people who could bought another car to drive every day. Right, exactly. You doubled the cars because people could afford it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, and the more flights, as you, as you showed, we all want a better life quality. Right. E economies are emerging, right? The average is 7%, but we're all flying more. Yeah. Uh, what do you think about hydrogen as a fuel? <laughs> okay. So, I actually have an opinion, but it's an uninformed opinion. And you, others might have a better opinion of what I think about that we're doing wrong in the long distance system. Like I think that we're, so anyway, personal opinion, not professional opinion. We are, we're electrifying the ground transportation system and we know we need to do that. And we have these goals to try to get the aviation system to a certain percentage of emissions compared to some year, some base year. I actually think we need to like zero out the emissions on the ground and save the fuel for the type of flying that we decide is most essential for our global society. And so, you know, it's a pie in the sky sort of professor type nice little dream, but, but I just don't think that, I mean, airplanes are gonna be the legacy users of fossil fuels. They have to be, we're not, we're not really, um, you know, there are, I have, there's very serious researchers around me in Waterloo who are talking about electric aviation. And they're talking about electric aviation for things like pilot training, where you take off and land a lot, and for providing essential services and supplies to islands, where you do a short haul um, plane. And I have to say that the way I think about aviation with that vast Canadian north has really changed in, in my two and a half years there. But I, I, I also just don't think that there's a magic bullet for aviation. I think we have to. We have to really think carefully about how we're going to use fossil fuels in aviation and, and make up for it somewhere else. Maybe that's just because I love flying. No, I, no, I have a question thing. about the Queen and tribal lands, but I think somebody else should ask. <laughs> the, the Queen, the Queen and, and tribal lands. Yes. Um, Isn't she dead? Maybe, maybe I. Maybe I have two <laughs> questions here, actually. Um, from my own personal background, I actually do have a, a deep history with actually being in very rural areas of Ontario and Manitoba, okay. all the way up in Churchill, yeah. on uh, Hudson Bay and such. And I had first hand experience actually seeing how the only way Churchill or different First Nation reservations are only connected to society via either rail or ferry. Yeah. Um, and so this is uh, one of my, my first question here is, um, Everyone deserves, how do I say, like, one wants a good standard of living. After seeing and being on these different reservations and such, these are not good places to be. Um, but to what extent, if we're looking at, like, the average uh, greenhouse gas emissions, to what extent should we 
to what extent should we be connecting different areas to, um, to what extent should we be connecting different reservations or just anywhere in the world we're looking at sub-Saharan Africa and such. An individual that moves from a rural location to an urban location consumes nine times as many resources as their as the rural counterpart. Um, to what extent, if we're looking at that, should we be building effective roadways and such that connect people, that essentially connect people in a rural location to an urban setting? Like you put it this way, a lot of people drive from uh, adjacent to Lake Nipigon they drive eight hours down to see like football games down in Minneapolis. I mean, to what extent is that a necessity in life? Um, this is a second question. My background is not in this. Thank God there's political scientists and sociologists at the table. So yeah. I'm going to defer to that answer. I mean, this is my second question is like what we've seen emerging technologies is actually using like great uh, short Flights, as you've been putting it, connecting more rural, smaller locations to a big international hub. Uh, we've seen uh, nascent technologies such as battery uh, electrified airplanes and such. To what extent would that help uh, reduce the greenhouse gas emissions that we're going to see with the rising uh, air consumption everywhere in the world? I just do not think that the alternative fuels save us. I think that there's alternative vehicle designs, yes, but I just can't see the alternative fuels coming soon enough, although the hydrogen, you know, that seems realistic. Um, but the, the, the electric planes are small, they're very small. Um, so that, that's where I think that we do have to price our way out of this and and whenever you price things right you need to have social policies that address the equity issues you're talking about um, we talk a lot about that in Vermont, actually which you know which with um, fuel taxes and you know our, our leadership was very much against increasing gasoline taxes because it was a burden on the rural poor and it was a real burden on the rural poor but i just wondered why we couldn't get around that by somehow you know supporting them um, in the transition phases or something. And you raise good questions and I, they, they are beyond my... And does anybody else want to answer any of them, I guess? Is, yeah. To answer, no, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> Amy was next, then the Gil, then the Queen. <laughs> uh, I, I guess somewhat related, but I think of back to the definition of act access and accessibility, and it's the ability to reach the places you need to go, more or less, I'm paraphrasing. So right. Right. Um, and I think of the folks in Thunder Bay even, or the next town over, and an eight hour trip to go to the doctor, and we can connect them by transportation, but there's a social problem that, is not necessarily a transportation one, is that they don't have doctors in their mm -hmm. town. Yeah. Um, so there's like take people to their doctors eight hours away or have healthcare options and grocery stores. Well, there's also the telemedicine, place. which is sure. important right, right. in really, that portfolio thing you're talking about. Yeah, really important connection. Um, but I, I guess I, I, thinking about this question of like who we can build the roadways from the rural areas where we have these flights. But blowing up that question even further. But, but do we need to? Because it doesn't look to me like there is an, a modal difference. We always like to think that airplanes are so inefficient, but this data, granted on a very specific subset, doesn't suggest that we should be building highways. Because then we're going to reduce right. travel. Oh, certainly. Which is what right, right. we're getting Right, at. yeah. So I, I'm not advocating for building highways. <laughs> don't, <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what Tim was watching. But basically, like creating mobility options for folks to reach the services and goods that they need. Um, but I guess this is like kind of a bigger question or bigger order question. So, with real, I think, a really urgent need around uh, trying to use the transportation system to solve 
what are our other public policy problems? Yes, I, get, I think I agree with you that there's a disconnect between our social problems, our social goals, and what we do in our transportation system. And maybe an easier example than the ones we're struggling with around air travel and rural access and, um, is uh, just when we think about um, during the Obama era, there was a big act where we poured all sorts of money into transportation, but really we were trying to create jobs. So we do all sorts of funny things with yeah. transportation that is not about accessibility. And I think that's what you're saying. Right, right. And I think that that is absolutely at play here. So for example, an, uh, an example in this realm is that does everybody sort of realize that if you're not SFO and you have an airport in your city, you're subsidizing the airlines to provide service to your airport. You're probably running your airport like a business. It's like a mall and you're making the money from the tenants and the parking and you're subsidizing the airports or the airlines to provide you with service for economic development in the region. So I, I think in some ways it comes back to the discussion we had before uh, class or before seminar about even we as transportation professionals can't quite define what transportation is. We can't say what the goal is. And it's because we struggle with the definition of accessibility that it that really it's not mobility. You don't mobility is not much on a roller coaster. Mobility is not of use for it's not the end. It's a means, right? And so in some ways, educating people about accessibility, which I know you guys do here in a local and regional sense all the time. And, and I hope that I convinced you should add long distance to your portfolio of sort of advocacy. It's, it's sort of teaching people that that's what we do. We're not building highways, we're not paving roads. We're asking about accessibility. And, and I struggle with that too. Sort of, I think about the fact that, you know, oh, see my grandchildren, that is really, that's quality of life for me. Um, but I chose to move away from them. And now I need fossil fuels to get my quality of life for my grandchildren. Like if you're in this vicious cycle. Oh, sorry. Gil, um, um, this maybe I'm in the table. Uh, you almost answer my question, I think, that we cannot define accessibility without defining necessity. Uh, and, and I think that we are trying for too long to avoid it. Uh, and I will not go to the doctors, that's easy. But our uh, high speed rail from here to, our high speed rail from here to LA, we never ask our district needed. We always said, this is the demand. People will be at the airport and all want to go to LA. Do they actually need to go to LA five times a week? And, and, and I think that we have to tackle But then, then we come full circle around to, you know, that context sensitive solutions was the best phrase in the late 80s. And these indigenous communities that we're sort of talking about in rural areas, and we're coming full circle around to the fact that we as the experts of the professionals can't define what that community needs, right? We have to work in partnership with them as the stakeholders to define the future they want. But then you turn around and you say, well, we can't each community and each culture and each network of people have our own global aviation system. You know, we have to sort of cooperate on a worldwide scale to accomplish that system. And so we keep getting caught between. Yeah. That's kind of my, my actual question. There was a number. Uh, out of this long tree, how many of them are uh, recreational? How many of them are not uh, like just one region destination, but a circular? What, what was kind of... It was, was, was two-thirds two personal, as I recall, and one-third work. But, but the personal, a, personal yeah. probably have like different... In the data you looked at. Yeah. That was in, my in question, data we was collected. what about trip, how did trip purpose get involved with this? It's hard. It's so hard. It's hard. I feel like I've, worked, I've left you more confused I told than you started. you started. a provocative question. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, the queen. It was related to land use um, back in Alberta. Yes. And all the forests and every decision had to be run by it was property of the queen, like 80% of the tundra forest. So 
But I think this is more interesting because it's coupled with First Nations. I should have called tribal. Right? It's um, indigenous. In, a, in a sustainable program at the University of Calgary, they were teaching us to ignore First Nations and decide what to do with the land, even if it was their sacred land, because that's how things were done in legacy. <laughs> Uh, but we did have to respect the property of the queen. And so this is a uh, teaching from 2018 at the University of Calgary. Uh, I'm glad to hear something different from Waterloo. Um, but you know, Trudeau had really good PR, right? We really thought he was nice. Uh, the, the, the question on my work on the indigenous and sparse, not even rose to get to the communities in Mexico was, Gil, Tim, Amy touched on uh, the needs. Like you mentioned a number, a thousand people. Nobody's going to build an airport for a thousand people. Uh, why do they live there? If, if they're First Nations, you don't have a right to move them. But maybe there used to be a mine that isn't there anymore. There's different. Um, so it's, it'd be interesting. It's also very specific by community, as you just said, uh, to assess the needs. But in my real experience in a very different context, um, the needs could be met with alternative options to building infrastructure that back home was not feasible. They needed water, they needed clear things that could be, yes, electricity, a sewage, things that could be, um, that there are many options to, to supply most of the needs without touching transportation. Uh, well, and, but those of us in the room like to believe that everything is because of transportation. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I agree with you. There, there's, I think that there is, there is a really complex conversation going on in Canada about Indigenous communities. And it, it, it is a piece of equity, diversity, and inclusion that I hadn't really been exposed to in the places I've lived in the US. And I guess just in the interest of time, I'll sort of summarize a piece of it that I really love is, is sort of um, the um, paying attention to place and paying attention to the land. And, and I, I think that that does lead back into transportation because that's how, that's, you know, that's, that's how we experience places and land. But the, can't always constantly be in motion, right? You've got to be in a place. And, and I think I like some of the conversations that are coming out because of this, but um, there's also the very complex stuff you're talking about related to the oil economy in Canada and uh, life cycle analysis and some of those decisions and how engineers and economists can do studies and sort of have a predetermined conclusion and try to convince communities of it like that that is the world we live in it's really really difficult and, and related to all this it's sort of the world we live in is that aviation is good without question and we should question we're researchers we should <coughs> and sure may you go into a super complex and then bring it get back to some simplicity asking the questions the actual needs of, of the people can tell us and then some core ones will be transportation because people really want to see something that's okay. Yeah. Uh, others might not be, but that might reduce uh, a lot of the, the need and increase the da -da -da. Yeah. Final thought? A final thought? <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping you all were going to solve my accessibility oh, measurement <laughs> problem. <laughs> But no, just thank you. It's nice to be here and hear all your ideas. And so thank you so much for having me. Thank you.